Today I'm really delighted to um, be able to present Professor Karen Nakamura to you. Uh, Karen's a relative newcomer still uh, at Berkeley, uh, having come here from Yale University a couple of years ago where uh, she was uh, associate professor in uh, anthropology uh, and also chair of uh, LGBTQ uh, studies at Yale. Uh, she is the Robert and Colleen Haas Chair in Disability Studies and Chair of our Disability Clusters, um, Disability Studies Cluster uh, at the Haas Institute. Um, she's a cultural visual anthropologist who's done some path-breaking work, most recently a disability of the soul on um, mental illness and schizophrenia in Japan. And today she will be talking about uh, disability studies as white disability studies slash disability studies as intersectional disability studies. So please give a warm welcome to Karen Nakamura. So I thought today I would just try to, I, uh, when I was asked to give a talk, I thought, well, why don't I just try to use this as a, as a provocation and try to get engage us into a, a conversation. Um, and so I, I have a title, uh, which is designed as a slightly provocative title, and um, I'm going to make some statements which are clear exaggerations, and clearly things are not as simple or as um, defined as I say. And so um, this is where um, I want you to push back um, and say, actually, no, you're wrong, that you've stepped too far. Um, so the title comes out of, um, there's an essay in um, the second edition of the Disability Studies Reader, um, which came out in 2006 by a promising African American scholar named Chris Bell, who um, unfortunately is no longer with us. And his um, title is the source of this provocation. He argued in it that disability studies is really white disability studies. Oh, and I wanted to apologize. Um, for technical reasons, I had uh, large uh, uh, print handouts, but a series of unfortunate events caused the um, large print handouts to be uh, small print or non-existent print. And so that's um, my fault. If you would like a copy, I know HIFIS is um, recording this. Um, if it's like previous events, they'll have the recorded version as well as a transcript on their website, uh, which always makes me nervous as a speaker because um, whenever you get transcribed, you end up sounding like Donald Trump. So, um, <laughs> always a dangerous thing. So, I'll try to speak in full sentences for the transcriber. Okay, so, um, back to white disability studies, the bigly white disability studies. Um, so, Chris Bell in this paper, his provocation is that, look, you know, and he starts off, um, we need to call um, a thing for what it is. And disability studies to him just seemed very much that it was white disability studies in all of the different ways that one could explore. Of course, this was also a provocation coming in and commissioned for a book called The Disability Studies Reader. So um, he notes that um, he wants to call a shrimp a shrimp and acknowledge disability studies for what it is, white disability studies. In contradistinction to disability studies, White Disability Studies recognizes its tendency to whitewash disability, disability history, ontology, and phenomenology. White Disability Studies, while not wholeheartedly excluding people of color from its critique, by and large focuses on the work of white individuals and itself is largely produced by a core of white scholars and activists. White Disability Studies envisions nothing ill advised with this leaning because it is innocently done and far too difficult to remedy. The synoptic review of some of the literature and related aspects of disability studies bears this out. Okay, so again, this is in 2006 that, that he's writing it. And so in this paper, he looks at texts, films, and conferences that were produced in, in this um, time span preceding his paper. So there were various things. Uh, there was um, a, a, um, a film. There was a couple of books, uh, Vital Signs, Crip Culture Talks Back. Uh, uh, a book, No Pity, People with Disabilities Forging a New Civil Rights Movement, A Matter of Dignity, Changing the Lives of, this, uh, of the Disabled, Claiming Disability, Knowledge and Identity, Enforcing Normalcy, Disability, Deafness and the Body. And then there's a Queer Disability Conference here in the Bay Area. Those first, those middle four were books, but there's a Queer Disability Conference 
um, that was here in the Bay Area that I think um, some of the people in this room attended. And it was noted um, the conference organizers tried very hard to incorporate um, people of color, but for various reasons that was not made difficult. And uh, uh, folks who attended the conference felt very excluded. People of color who attended the conference felt very excluded. And so, and unfortunately, um, and so our People of Color Caucus came forward. There's a lot of discussions. And unfortunately, one of the attendees uh, at the conference made a statement which will uh, go down in infamy. This person uh, said to one of the um, um, uh, uh, um, um, attendees, being disabled is just be like being black. So society should stop hating us and give us our rights. Um, and you can see what they're trying to what they're trying to say um, in terms of the equivalencies of civil rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it was just so clumsily said and so problematic um, um, that um, and, and and it's you know it's it's being said in in a way that sort of makes it clear that the person saying it wasn't really thinking that actually there might be um, black audience members who might hear this and and interpret in a, in in a way that's that's uh, very problematic. Um, and then um, the Society for Disability Studies, the annual conference in 2005, also had a number of problems with the uh, People of Color um, um, Caucus. And, um, and this was all happening in, in the span before he wrote this paper in 2006. Oh, and then there's an MLE conference, sorry, um, that also was um, um, exclusionary. And so I guess the question is, are we any better in 2018, 2017? So I decided to, to think um, back. And for one, the conference of the Society for Disability Studies, we were still having problems with representation um, within, uh, within the Society for Disability Studies. It hasn't gotten better. Our conferences, this is constantly comes up as an issue um, and one that's, that's clearly still vexing us. But leaving the conferences aside, let me, I decided, I, well, why don't I look at journals as a metric to see whether or not disability studies has actually been able to address questions of race. And so I looked at our flagship journal, the Disability Studies Quarterly, and this was very rough, I, um, a, a rough analysis. Um, um, and out of the 40, and I looked at all the um, articles, review articles, uh, no, sorry, all the articles um, that were written and uh, published in, sorry, 2017, there are 47 articles that um, DSQ published, and f of them, only four mentioned race, racialization, the word black, uh, colonization. So I, I tried a couple of keywords, um, um, such as to see uh, how they might mention uh, uh, race. And so we're at just uh, under 10%. Um, so you either think that's really great, it's like, wow, four out of 47, that's pretty good for us, or you think that's terrible. Then I looked at book reviews um, with the proxy that, well, book reviews really, you know, they, the review editors try to get the key books that are coming out to be reviewed. And so maybe book reviews are a bit better. Um, one out of the 17 of the book reviews looked at issues of race. Um, um, now, I then looked at the, at the, um, at the, the titles themselves that mention race. Then I looked at the reviews themselves to see if the content of the reviews mention race. And then we did better with seven out of 17 of the content. But sometimes it's, it's only in passing and, and it's clear that it's not um, um, uh, really the, the, the key uh, force of the book. Or in some cases, these are edited volumes. And so one of the essays deals with race, but the rest of the volume doesn't. In any case, it's, you can see that disability studies, to a very large extent, um, thinking about racialization, thinking about intersectionality, is still a minor part of, of the field. So, um, and it's really unfortunate because you think of some of the books, um, um, like there's a uh, book um, that um, is. There's a collection of stories about, um, 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 let's see, if I had, do I have the full list? It's a review essay about autism. And the entire span of the books about autism, this is the book, um, um, Stories of Autism on the Left, none of them, at least according to the reviewer, the reviewer doesn't mention race. And I, I, I don't go in and look at the books to see if they mention race. But the reviewer doesn't mention race in the, in the long list of books about autism that they're talking about. So there's problems with, with my method. 
because um, this is meant as a quick and dirty. It could be that the box didn't do it and the, it's actually the reviewer who is trying to remove um, discussions of race racialization. Um, but my, I'm using this as a proxy because my thought is if, if they are really are talking about race, then actually it would get mentioned. But the titles didn't give hints to that, nor did her discussion. Um, and then another one about intellectual disabilities, also no mention about race in, in um, that text. So we're not, um, there are many opportunities that we could have incorporated that we, that we aren't. So, but you know, I thought, well, you know, am I, am I just being unfair to disability studies? Well, what happens if we look at another journal? Or what happens if we look at the other side? And this is where you can throw stones at me. Um, let's look at uh, the Journal of African American Studies um, and whether or not it mentions disability. So is there, is there just a sort of mutual um, um, uh, lack of conversation going on here? So I just picked uh, Journal of African American Studies as, as a proxy for our, our leading journal. Um, and in 2017, I looked at the 36 articles that were published in it and about three um, of the articles, of the three of the 36, use the terms disabled or disability, but many times it was just in passing. So they'd describe the no child left behind law, and they'd say, well, it's a law that deals with disability, blah, 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 but really it was um, not dealing with uh, disability in, in any sort of um, um, uh, in-depth way. Um, the one, um, um, and again, this is unfortunate because if you look at the text, there are, there are uh, ways in which that disability creeps in. So this is one of the texts that mentions disability, um, but in passing, but it could have done much more, is that, um, I'll read from it. Among all racial and ethnic groups in the US, blacks have the highest morbidity and mortality for all diseases and have higher rates of disabilities and shorter lifespans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it talks, it's talking about health, but um, it's using health without and, and this is one of the few instances where they, they use the disability word. Um, they're using, talking about health metrics without using the word disability. And again, this might be unfair. But I mean, it's my proxy way of thinking, well, why are we using health instead of the word disability and so forth? Okay. Um, another one, um, there's a special issue done on prints. And so one of the articles talks, one of the few um, times that disability pops up again is talking about um, um, C.S. Johnson had written in 1941 um, about the Emmett Till murder um, and um, the quote from 1941 includes the word disabilities. Both in the city and in the country, the disabilities which his caste suffers, that is um, blacks, are maintained primarily by a system of force. Um, so it's, it's using disability in, 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 a, um, in the older sense of the word and, and not the contemporary sense. So we're seeing bits and pieces of the word disability, but um, um, not in, in great numbers. OK. So then I thought, well, let me then, um, maybe general <coughs> African American studies is unfair. Maybe let's look at um, queer studies, the other f um, field which I feel much um, better at in, in terms of um, um, poking at. So GLQ is the, the flagship journal in, in queer studies, or one of the flagship journals in queer studies. And so again, I looked in 2017, all the essays, all the, uh, sorry, articles, um, peer-reviewed articles, so I'm not including um, book reviews, I'm not including the introduction, um, I'm not including commentary. So um, in GLQ in 2017, there were just two articles that dealt with um, disability. And one of them was on uh, HIV and AIDS, and so it talks about the disability caused by HIV and AIDS. So, um, And then the second one was, a uh, um, a uh, really nice essay that, that um, was, a, was a call to arms, basically, saying let's think about sexuality and disability together. And there's a slash between uh, dis and ability that I just want to talk about, uh, meander off for a second, because it's an important one, because I think it, to me, it, it, it indicates something. So, uh, disability. Um, many disability activists have a lot of problems with um, dis slash ability. And when you use that term, it, it indicates a certain distance from the activist community. Um, and why? Well, part of it, it's a euphemism. Differently abled, dis slash abled. Um, 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 
And we know euphemisms are really short for you're screwing me and you refuse to admit that you're screwing me. So you're using a euphemism for the fact that you're screwing me. Um, and it contains an amount of patron patronizing, uh, patronization in it, right? So we, the authors who want to use dis disability um, often use it in the sex that, oh, I really want to focus on your ability and not on your disability. And um, um, that, that contains an enormous amount of, of patronization. Um, you know, it would be like if, you know, maybe I'll dig myself into the same hole as the person talked about um, race at, at the queer conference. But it would be like if we said, well, race, it really has the word ace in it. So there's no race, there's just ace. <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's uh, you know, it, it contains this, well, oh, you know, we are, we're just really being very positive about you. And, and isn't that nice that, that you have a dis slash ability? And then finally, the problem is, is because it displaces the focus. And, and that is the problem with this ability and differently abled. Right? The problem, the reason why the disability community chose the word disabled is because of the social model. Disabled people are being disabled by society. So we, society is the one that's disabling us. And so when people choose to say, well, no, we're going to focus on ability, it's the entirely um, um, not understanding the reason for the word choice. And it's an important word choice. And, and so um, when I see that in an academic article, um, it, to me it's indicating, again, that there's some distance from, from the people on the ground who are thinking and using terms. Um, 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 and so it's unfortunate. So there's a larger context in which right now disability studies is, is booming in terms of an intellectual discipline. There's a lot of people rushing into it. A lot of people, especially who are coming out of different fields, especially queer theory, who are rushing into disability. And many times they are distant from the community. And, and, um, and um, well, I'll talk, talk about that in, in a second. So I'll actually, next slide. Right, this next slide. So, I want to jump to why does disability studies avoid conversations about race? I think we very much need to have conversations about race, but to a large extent, I think we have been avoiding conversations about race. I think one of it is that the reality is that many disability scholars, study scholars are white, uh, many, and many of them are, are non-disabled. And the reason that they're coming into disability studies, and this is one of my unfairnesses, is that because they have a child, uh, a sibling, or a parent who became disabled, and suddenly they discover disability as a topic. And so that's uh, why they're rushing in. And they, ha they aren't coming in from communities that are intersectional, that have already struggled with questions around language, around power, around representation, and so forth. And so we get a certain amount of naivete with um, some of the newest scholars who are coming into disability studies. Then the bigger problem, so that's a minor problem. The bigger problem, though, is that academia is, is a real fictive meritocracy. We like to believe it's a meritocracy, but it's really, it's really not. And to a large extent, in academia, we like to think, well, you know, what do I mean by it's a fictive meritocracy? We like to think, well, if you're smart and you try hard, you will succeed in academia. And to some extent, that's true, but that ignores all the forms of um, exclusion, all the forms of, of um, racism, ableism, sexism, structural violence that go on. Um, and, but we don't often have these conversations. And oftentimes we believe that, well, you know, uh, disabled students, disabled scholars, well, we have the uh, uh, ADA, we have services like the DSP. Um, if anything, they're being helped more than um, non-disabled students, so they, they should have nothing to complain about or they have a leg up. It's the same conversations that often happen in more hushed tones around race happen in very um, um, uh, public ways around disability. I think most of the uh, faculty who are here, who have been in the faculty meeting, have heard various conversations around disabled students that sort of uh, reflect that attitude. So, um, the first point, um, the ADA has this problem. The ADA is supposedly a civil rights law for disabled people. It has this um, fundamental glitch in it, which is that as originally written in, in, the ni in 1990, the ADA says that um, a disability is something that uh, causes uh, um, impairment to a major life activity. 
The problem is that the Supreme Court in a number of decisions decided that working is a major life activity um, to the point in which it became a catch-22. If you could work, then obviously you don't have a disability. And the only way you could show you have a disability is by not being able to work. And so if that's the case, well, then really no, no um, uh, ADA suit, um, uh, employment suit, is going to succeed because if somebody's working, then they're not disabled. Um, and if they can't work, well, then they're disabled and they can't work, and thus the exclusion is not discriminatory. So, um, and that's played out within um, the university setting as well. Um, so we ha then have problems where the disabled people who are, who are in academia um, are a re relatively select bunch. And um, um, activist and general kick-ass um, community scholar Corbett O'Toole has called them the able disabled. I'm not sure about that language. I have mixed feelings about that language. Um, but I think what she, another way to say it, I'm not sure if that's better, any better, non -apparent, people with non-apparent disabilities or non-disabling disabilities, and I'm not sure if I'm then getting myself into the same catch-22 that um, the Supreme Court sort of dug itself into. Generally, the people with disabilities who are able to succeed in, in academia tend to be the ones with either non-apparent disabilities and we're hiding it, we're sucking it up in particular ways, or our disabilities are ones that, um, uh, uh, with uh, various things, we're able to uh, uh, at least succeed or partially succeed in, in, in this fictive meritocracy. But the reality is, is that there's a ton of people who are just uh, you know, adjuncts, who are lecturers, who are not um, able to succeed in the tenure track market, who are disabled. Then, um, as Kim, uh, Kim Crenshaw says, you know, the, well, well, then the question is, where are the intersectional scholars? And, and um, Kimberly Crenshaw has said that intersectionality is the ability to, to be run over twice and standing in an intersection get hit from both directions. <laughs> and that's really the case with disabled scholars. So uh, disabled scholars of color really lie the, at the double intersection of getting whammied on race and getting ram whammied by disability. And so um, they are, are, are really um, um, absent in academia. So I think that's part of the re some of the reasons why, um, as a field, as a um, um, scholar society, disability studies really has had trouble um, pulling in conversations about, about race. So when we think about the various disability civil rights laws, starting with the Rehabilitation Act, um, um, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, um, the ADA, all of these um, laws are really targeted and benefit a certain model of person, the ideal citizen. And the closer you can get to being a white, heterosexual, married, able-bodied, white-collar, middle-class, English-speaking, non-disabled male, the more that the laws really are suited towards you. That's the model that the legislators had in mind. And the more you drift away, the more complex and more difficult it becomes for you to accrue um, any, any of the benefits. Again, we think of the ADA, and, and the, the, at least in terms of employment, the person that really benefits is, well, this notion of a uh, heterosexual man who's, in a, who's um, using a wheelchair but has a law degree, and so can just roll into the courtroom and say their briefs and then roll out, and that is all great. That, that because they're white collar, um, um, in a, a um, high, um, uh, in, in a profession in which um, the ability to orate and speak and to think is valued, they are doing just fine. The ADA can protect them, but the ADA doesn't protect people who fall out of that, right? So um, um, if uh, uh, you're female and disabled, the employment rates are terrible. If you're black and disabled, the employment rates are terrible. If, you, um, if your disability ha happened at a time and, and impeded your ability to go to school, uh, your um, uh, employment rates are, ho are horrible. Um, pretty much any, any sort of um, um, thing that will drift you out of this charm circle of, of the white heterosexual male able, um, 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 pushes you out of, of the scope of, of any of the laws that are designed to, to protect you. Yeah. Can I add one? Yeah. I'm just thinking about a friend and research interlocutor yeah. of mine. The other thing that relates is immigration status. Yeah, immigration so status. Thank this, you. This friend is yeah. able in the state of California to apply for yeah. things related to state disability. Yeah. 
that's temporary but not for a federal yeah. because of their magician staff. Yeah, yeah, so, so thank you, Seth. Um, okay, so um, amongst my qualifications, I, I, I think it's fair to ask, so I had previously given stats on, well, why should African-American studies en engage in conversations with disability? So um, a couple months ago, uh, Sue Schweik um, uh, organized a really fantastic conference here called uh, Academic Ableism. And one of the speakers was uh, Wanda um, Blanchett. And she was talking about the disproportionate representation of uh, African-American students in special education. And this, um, as in many things, you know, African-American students are both overserved and underserved. And the mechanism in which um, 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 the, uh, the structures of uh, racism occur are in their labeling as requiring um, uh, special education services um, or being labeled as um, uh, um, uh, uh, second language speakers and being shoved off into tracks which would not lead into college at the same time that they're being underserved because the actual special ed tracks that might lead to um, um, focused tutoring and other services, um, um, for example, for uh, um, uh, learning disabilities aren't available to them, right? So they're being labeled with particular labels that don't get them services while being um, um, prevented from being labeled appropriately in ways that might actually get them services that they might actually be able to use. Um, and so this though, right, because it's education has this lifelong effect that the way that racism is operating in our school systems is through the mechanism of disability labeling. And I think we need to think carefully about that one could say, well, it's just racism, but the racial, cate the, the racial categories are being now changed into disability categories. And that is, I think, the process by which we, we being the United States as a whole, is making our racism tolerable um, by, by, by um, um, using the language of, of disability. So let's see, this quote from her. So African-American students are disproportionately referred to and placed into the high incidence special educational categories of mental retardation, emotional and behavioral disorders, and learning disabilities. Once labeled as having these disabilities and placed in placing the special ed, African-American students make achievement gains and exit special education at rates considerably lower than white students who are identified as having the same disabilities. Third, although the field of special ed has moved towards more equitable treatment of students with disabilities by advocating for inclusive general ed placement, Many African American students who are placed in the less subjective low incidence categories of developmental disabilities are educated in segregated, self-contained settings with little or no exposure or access to the non-disabled peers or to the general ed curricula. Also in Blanchett's criticism is that by and large, um, the field of education has been mostly um, a white field. And because of that, because the teachers who are coming in, the teachers who are teaching the teachers, the superintendents who are monitoring the teachers, are coming out of particular educational circumstances that um, are making them not look at racial categories but also disability categories appropriately, um, um, this form of, of structural racism is, is, and academic ableism is allowed to continue. So there's another area in which we also want to think about um, um, disability, right? So um, Right now, we have this enormous problem where um, African-American youth are being killed by police. African-American men are being, young men are being killed by police, right? So they're being killed at a rate that's about seven times that of, of the um, average population. Hugely problematic. And what I, um, this is a conversation about violence in the U.S. It's coming in the aftermath of yet another series of school shootings. Um, I want to focus on one element, though, which is increasingly in a lot of um, pol uh, police homicide incidences, um, they're now starting to use the argument of mental illness as the rationale. So right now, it's just about above 25 percent. Oh, we thought that that person was mentally ill. That's why we feared for our lives. That's why we shot them. Um, and. I um, I would hazard to guess that this is increasing, that it's a particularly effective rationale, right? We see that rationale being used to talk about the shooter in Florida, right? They are mentally ill. Um, um, and um, the mentally ill are being constructed as this category of, ra of people who, for whom one can have rational fear for one's life and thus homicide it. 
is um, entirely justified because they might, if you don't kill them first, they will kill you. So I am hesitant to guess that um, I don't have the statistics for the uh, racial black breakdown of, those, um, of this category of people against the racial life category of, of folks as a whole. Um, but I would hazard to guess that African Americans um, um, are representing, uh, like many things, overrepresented in, in this chunk because it becomes this, again, non-racial way of talking about fear, um, uh, about talking the, about the um, 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 uh, self-defense and so forth. Okay. And we saw that in 2017, 2016, there were a lot of um, prominent um, murders of, of African American young men. And, and so a number of the journal articles that did hit for um, the intersection of African American and dis disability were talking about um, um, young African American men who are disabled and then shot. So, we then also have this problem that when we use the word disability, um, we often don't include things that we really should. Um, um, and uh, um, Seth Holmes, who had um, just commented, um, has written a really great book talking about the, um, um, the disability, the illnesses caused by environmental toxicity in migrant farm workers. Um, those often don't get manifest depending on the label that the farm worker has, or the, uh, often they're not diagnosed. But we often, in our sphere of in disabilities, when we think about, well, who is disabled? Who do we want to write about? Who do we want to talk about? Um, what do we label as disability studies? Um, um, environmental toxins often do not fall into our purview, except when it affects one of the communities that, that are close to us. We might think, for example, in Flint, Michigan, and other communities, the high levels of lead and other toxins. Um, and um, the considerations of that on the long-term health of, of, of uh, um, uh, many youth. We often don't think of, for example, diabetes as existing within the purview of disability, right? Often um, it's, it's viewed as a, a lifestyle illness, and so would diabetes be considered uh, um, 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 well within disability studies? But diabetes has, and part of the reason might be that diabetes has disparate impact um, um, between different communities. Um, and so um, is the reason why we're excluding it because, well, it's not impacting the core of white disability studies and, and the kin of white disability studies, and so let's not include it. Alcoholism and other substance ab abuses also, are they being pushed out for a particular ways? Now again, this is all unfair, right? So perhaps now in, t in the current moment, we are moving towards it. But um, again, this is designed as a provocation and, and more of a let's hurry up and, and actually get to this point where we can talk about uh, these issues. Okay, so what would then um, um, good intersectional disability studies look like? Well, I think it's already happened. I mean, so um, in many ways, we've always already had people who are talking about intersectional disability studies. You know, or Audre Lorde's whole you know, opus was thinking through what does someone who is legally blind, who didn't speak, you know, her whole um, Zami, uh, her autobiography was about this um, collusion, um, collision between uh, disabl dis different disability categories. The Bridge Called My Back also had stories of disabled women within it. Um, and so we've had these, you know, within at least feminist studies, these core texts that have dealt with race, gender, and disability. But these often get read in ways that erase some of those particular categories when they're convenient to be erased. And so, one, we maybe need to re-recover re our texts. Two, I think there's a number of really young scholars, and, and I guess they're no longer young anymore, and Namala Aravels is, is one of them, who are really dealing with this head on, and they're becoming um, really kick ass within the community. Um, so, this um, um, article, Unspeakable Offenses Untangling Race and Disability and Discourse of Intersectionality, really, really provocative, really pushing us in new directions. Highly recommend if you get a chance to, to grab a copy. Um, Leah Ben Moshe is also another scholar who's written about race, gender, and disability. Um, and so this is another one in women, gender, and families of color. Um, and then I was um, um, 
missing uh, one more slide, which was also about uh, some other, other young scholars. But it is happening. These conversations are happening. But there's, it's still there's going to be this lag before they've um, really pushed it, um, into, into the main four. So that's, that's uh, sort of where I wanted to end. And I'm now ready for all the FLURIA people to tell me um, just, how, just how long and unfair um, this presentation was. So, so launch away. So thank you. Yeah, Anne. Well, sorry to disappoint you here, but I thought this was a great talk, and I have no argument with anything that you said. I would love to, for us all to talk more yeah. about the Florida shooting and yeah. about the assumption of <coughs> mental illness and yeah. how we need what we need is better mental health care yeah. and maybe locking weird people up. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts about that or if other people in the room have thoughts about it. Or maybe they're, maybe that's not yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, in 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 that case, as as um, well as the uh, New York shootings, that they're both being classified as either mental illness or autistic, and so we we see these two categories being being used to identif identify the subject as potentially dangerous, potentially hostile. You know, um, and yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, hugely problematic, and, and from the disability community standpoint, it, we have trouble intervening in those conversations in, in effective ways. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to open that up. Takia? I don't want to shift you know, the dialogue unless people really wanted to engage in that, but I have a pretty strong feeling Just the justification of homicide, you know, yeah. using this. Um, and, I, and I'm curious um, of, to hear more about your thinking of kind of like why there might not be more dialogue between the two subjects based on the fact that African Americans were constitutionally defined as less than human. So yeah. I think part of the scholarship in African American studies was to re or to establish, you know, a sense, move far, as far away as possible exactly. from this idea of being yeah. less than ideal. Yeah, exactly. One of the one of the books I wanted to highlight but didn't make its way into my slide deck is a book called Protest Psychosis, which looks at the shift between how schizophrenia was framed. It used to be framed as a white woman's disease very early on. Um, and so you had photographs of women in, in sanatoria knitting or, you know, at the town's fair sort of waving to people. Um, and then in the 50s and 60s, it started to be switched into a, a, a disease that affected African-American men and made them angry and rebellious and didn't respect authority. And so, you know, we have shades of drapedomania in there. And so um, um, that shift, I think, is one of the reasons why it's hard from that. There's um, issues. Uh, again, this might be unfair to, to say. I, I'll, I'll say it a different way. Within the gay and lesbian community in the U.S., we've tried very hard to disabuse any notions of mental illness and relationships with gay and lesbian or um, trans identities. Right? There's a long legacy of, of um, psychiatry being used within gay and lesbian communities as a way, right, conversion therapy and, and others to um, force um, uh, gay and lesbian individuals into um, institutional settings. And so there's this hesitancy to talk about categories within the queer community that overlap with um, um, mental illness. Um, and um, I think there may be a similar hesitation um, within African American communities about a long history of the use of psychiatric labels um, in ways that are abusive and reflective of racism that then do not allow the claiming of, the reclamation of, of people who, who have psychiatric disabilities to really be pulled in and, and owned and say, we need to protect those who are labeled with as having psychiatric disabilities. Yeah, Denise. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for your talk and for the provocation. Um, and, you know, I don't think 
the um, paradox you're setting up yeah. here is just um, specific to disability studies. I mean, I think academia in general is Eurocentric mm -hmm. and it's white. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, I encounter this when thinking about, say, how are we looking at sexual and gender fluidity? Yeah. Does it look the same for people of color, particularly in a global context? Yeah. And so if we think about something like disability, you know, how is that even constructed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what does a child with certain capabilities look like in mm -hmm. a totally different culture? I mean, yeah. this culture has had a history of, of marginalizing and you know, yeah. sending yeah. people institutionalizing its kids and its yeah. disabled. Um, yeah. That doesn't happen everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I was talking with someone about, they were saying that in Africa, for example, kids that might be institutionalized here learn many languages, they function yeah. as part of the community. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know what's happening yeah. contemporarily, but I do yeah. know that they're different cultural and, yeah. and class yeah. looks at something like disability just yeah. as there are with what does sexuality look, at, look like in a different yeah. context. So I struggle with like, you know, teaching race in general yeah. and opening up a space for talking about something from a non-Eurocentric yeah. uh, view. And I think that's where we have to look very carefully at, at social and cultural construction. Yeah, yeah, I, I entirely agree. I mean, uh, th this is a problem within many fields that we are strongly embedded in our, our, our context. There aren't many, for example, disability studies scholars who go abroad, and part of it is all the forms of academic ableism combined with going abroad is enormously taxing on the body-mind, and if you have a disability, doing um, that in another setting is some, often something that isn't doable. But as a result, disability studies is, is, has this parochialism that's not good. I mean, we often don't think about other alternative systems to the ADA and we get locked into the specifically American context. Um, but this uh, works against uh, many different contexts. And so, you know, um, um, w you know when I was chair of, of LGBTQ studies at, at, at um, Yale, how do you think, if we, if we take those, that sort of the string of alphabetic letters, how do we really map it into foreign places? How do we support work? that is being done in other contexts without engaging in what Joseph Massad has called uh, gay international. It's like, we are going to label you the lesbians of X or the trans of Y and sort of also engage in the work of flattening category, ca categorical difference in other places. Some people would really like that and, and part of the issue I had when I was chair of LGBTQ studies was all my money was coming in from rich gay men who really wanted to, us to be trans-historical and transculturally. Those are the gays, those are the gays, that's the gay, he's the gay, right, historically, right? Um, and say, oh, we had gay ancestors and we have gay kin over there. And, you know, that's why they were giving us boatloads of money because they thought that that was an important project, was this sort of, um, um, what's uh, often called sort of the gay, gay cartography. Let's all map gayness uh, uh, trans-historically transculturally so that we can claim and it's a very colonial move and we see this in, in, in multiple disciplines. Um, and so that's exactly why I think we need more conversations um, because disability, the categories operate very differently and maybe Dawn will, will yeah, so I want feed to into that. Yeah, thank you for your talk and your wonderful comments. You know, your comments, I have, even though we don't know each other, but I'd love to talk to you later. Um, your comments really brought that um, a really great book from 1996, The uh, Rejected Body by Susan Mundell, and she starts her uh, book about gender and disability by an example of an African woman and the way the distance that she can walk, the distance that we expect an American woman to walk in their <coughs> lives and who is the disabled in that situation. So I think it's a great example of culture, race, and disability, and gender coming all together. It's right in her first few pages, so it's really making mm -hmm. sense about that. Um, so I think, and I think it's a great comment, and someone who's non-American and studying disability in the U.S. I think it resonates with me as well. Um, I also wanted to bring up um, the book that I think is the one uh, book mm -hmm. that has race and disability in the, in mm -hmm. the title, and I, I would guess it's Ellen Samuels, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a magic yeah. dictation. It came out in 2014, yeah. and that's a really wonderful book, and really um, highly influenced me, and I assume it was 
speak with, so yeah. I'm, I'm really thankful for that. Um, and she really talks about the tendencies of identification of yeah. what we think about who is a person of a different race, who is a person of a disability, and then, yeah. you know, there's also another great book about um, disability, disability and passing, yeah. and how the idea of passing really translates yeah. from race to disability exactly. as well. So I think, you know, this whole idea yeah. of social construction and the fantasy of identification yeah. is something that unites both categories in such yeah. a, like, interesting yeah. Yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. And I think also another, and, and I didn't mean the, and I, uh, some of the slides are not there, um, didn't mean to mean that the texts I introduced are um, comprehensive. But another thing that's also happening, or has been happening for the last 40 years, is the use of various, uh, various ways of virtue signaling, being, of inclusivity. And um, Disability has become one of those mechanisms of, of virtue signaling. We are inclusive, we are welcoming. Um, one of the ways we will show that, for example, is have, and this has been going on for a long time, have a sign language interpreter who is standing right by me. Um, and so you can all see I have a sign language interpreter and aren't we all great and inclusive? Um, but if you actually talk to a deaf person, they don't want the sign language interpreter on the stage next to the speaker, they want them right in front of them um, and have, uh, hopefully have engaged in conversation so that the interpreter knows what the actual style of conversation that the deaf person might want. But that doesn't do any good for PR. So we often see um, in large events sign language interpreters who are, who are um, uh, used as, as virtue signals. And we see these types of virtue signals multiple times. Um, and those are also often in the same ways, you know, at least for in Japan, um, much of disability, the way that disability has been able to flourish is because it serves as an important proxy for inclusion. Japan doesn't have a great ability to talk about inclusion because it often denies any sort of diversity, but one one that it can though is disability. And so we become um, um, uh, what David Mitchell and, and um, Sharon Snyder have called uh, um, narrative prostheses. We become, uh, disabled people become this sort of tool by which other things get resolved or, or other things get shown. And so showing the inclusivity of, of, of disabled people then becomes this proxy, oh, aren't we a really great society? And we see this multiple times in, in the Facebook memes. Um, we've all seen things that the disability calls inspiration porn. It's like, oh my god, that, that um, kid with Down syndrome who got, next to, who got to sit next to the Pope, isn't he such a wonderful person for being inclusive of a of a child with Down syndrome, right? Uh, inspiration poem uh, memes uh, float daily around the net and become this way for us to all feel good. Uh, Charles. So uh, I certainly don't want to try to dismantle what you've done, which I think is very interesting. Um, I just wonder if you could sort of on, on your feet, literally for a moment, write a different paper, the second yeah. paper here, which is the, quali the quantitative methodology was really interesting mm -hmm. and sort of laying out the problem. I wonder if you could sort of shift to a qualitative mode and yeah. talk about epistemological intersectionality. Yeah. So how you see the influence of how basic terms get defined yeah. Yeah. through these, both the resonances, mm -hmm. which can be implicit, yeah. or sometimes the lack of intersections between yeah. these different sets of issues. So how does yeah. that shape the basic ways in which we yeah. could think about yeah. the sorts of issues that you want to? Yeah, and I think that was what I was trying to do. So one can, one can make an argument that how race and racism in the United States has operated has been confined around particular categories of, the, um, of, of defining African Americans as, as subhuman. And the way that that has been done around um, biology have all have tones of dis disability. So. Um, and the example of drapetomania was one of them, right? So that, um, and so one could have this argument that actually race and disability have always, always, always already been defined around similar t terms. And there are many good works, you know, Sue Schweik's amongst them, that have shown this sort of thread through various threads through history around which uh, racialized categories um, have been layered onto or uh, disability has been laid onto racialized categories in ways that mask the, the racism that's in there. And it's only when disability became a category that, um, um, uh, when the openings came up in, in the 60s and 70s, we're talking about it as a particular type of civil rights and a, type of, a particular type of 
disabled person managed to emerge that wasn't associated with them, that disability managed to flourish in a particular way. Um, so I, I think you could do, do that threading. Um, so you know, for my own current work, I'm trying to think of queer as a disability category, especially in the context of trans, and what it means for the trans movement to think of itself as a disability category. And it's, I think, possible in the context of Japan, because we don't have that association with mental illness. Um, um, and so there is no pushback in that sense. So, or, um, so trans people can articulate themselves as a disability category, whereas it's much harder here. So it's, it's possible, but this is sort of my appeal for, for sort of cross-cultural understandings, because it gives us this way of, of thinking through different categories in different contexts. Yeah, Sue. This makes me think about something I've been dying to ask you about, <coughs> um, and it's related to your question, too. I, I don't know how many of you heard about this article by um, Kimani Palma Neal that came out in a Fordham Law Journal this month. African American legal scholar. It's called Blackness as Disability? Question mark. Mm -hmm. And what she is arguing, um, First line of the abstract is recent incidents of police violence against unarmed African Americans and the lead-filled water of Flint, Michigan are only the most recent reminders. It goes on to argue, understanding the black racial designation as disabling can bring new clarity to the reality that racial categories in the United States were created explicitly to benefit some and disabled <coughs> others, and arguing for the use of disability law as the primary yeah. mechanism to combat racism. And of course, and I have about 50 responses to this, including thinking about the word disability, like Disraeli in the 19th century is talking about the disability of the Jews. And the word disability is first used as a word that means um, legal oppression. Yeah. And the second thing I thought of, of course, was intersectionality and about how this argument just seems, as far as I can tell, to obliterate, say, yeah. a black disabled woman. I mean, I don't know where yeah. it fits. But the third thing I thought about <coughs> is how interesting disability law is as civil rights law, because it doesn't assume a level playing field. It has a really different model, and it does potentially seem tremendously productive, and I thought about your work on trans. And what was interesting about this article is that basically from at least three positions, it was just slammed. Mm. Critical race scholars <laughs> hated it. Mm. Because the idea, because disability must feel like a wrongful accusation. Yeah. It can, it's like the way eugenics gets attacked by thinking, nobody actually deserved that. Exactly they what They were Takiya all was just saying, poor yeah. people or whatever. Yeah. Wrongful yeah. accusations, so we can't yeah. have it. And then from the dis disability end, it seemed like co-optation yeah. and um, um, ob obliteration. Yeah. Uh, there was almost no way for it to be heard as an interesting argument. And yet, I've got to say, I find it tremendously provocative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's all my tiptoeing around, really wanting not to step too far into, into uh, an overstatement, which would then get blown back in my face. Um, yeah. <laughs> so do you see your work as, as yeah. aligned with the Kurumushi? Yeah, I, I, you know, part of it is, you know, because part of it is because I've drunk the Kool-Aid and part of it, you know, as the harsh trend disability studies, I feel like, how are our disability studies is the metric by which we can analyze everything and let's be a real colonial power in that regard. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, unproblematically I'm, I'm colonizing other categories with disability as the overarching one. Um, um, yeah, yeah. So I, that this was a, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm a little bit cognizant that of, well, I'm very cognizant that that is a colonial move to say these categories uh, can be understand as disability categories. Um, um, although I would try to be a bit more subtle saying that racism, structural racism, has used disability as a way to, as a, as a functional method. And so if you want to understand racism, we need to understand the categories of disability, um, disablement that racism creates in order to justify particular types of violence. Um, um, and mistreatment, yeah. um, but it's a, it's it's very difficult to say to say that. Um, so, 
And I'm really glad this is on video and being transcribed and put on the web. <laughs> but thank you. You know, I just, I feel like it's so important to just like lift up gratitude because you're putting yourself in a, in a space to hold to say, in order for these kind of conversations to collide, you know, we have to, somebody has to be willing to just yeah. start it. And I feel like that's what you're doing. And I really appreciate that. You know, just the, the level of complexity. It's, you know, for me, what I'm taking away is there's, a, there's another layer of conversation. That, that now has to happen because we're talking about the, just the, uh, the obsession with categorizing people and trying to understand how an individual can show up and operate in society based on particular categories and, and develop strategies and methods for those people to exist to, for, you know, to what end or for what cause, right? There's something above that that's requiring mm -hmm. the obsession with needing to define and operate in a particular method or mode that works to, to the advantage of some that it works to the disadvantage of others. And that, you know, I, so I just want to lift up the gratitude to say, like, I, I get what you're doing, and it's a very great thing. I'm so grateful that you're doing it. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I, I was just going to say that I think, you know, one solution, because for me, I mean, being, thinking about health, thinking about the fact that so many people do not matter, yeah. um, that the strategy is to move away from whiteness as a reference point. Yeah. And once you do that, then I think it opens up how, what does the lens of race yeah. and ill health and disability mm -hmm. look like? Because there's just so many examples mm -hmm. of, I mean, diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, there are some groups that half of them are going to have diabetes, 50% yeah. of the population, and the amputation rate for Native Americans is probably yeah. 20 times that of whites. Yep. And mm -hmm. in Indian country, they build um, the bungalows with yeah. the ramps. Yeah. Everybody's bungalow has a ramp yeah. because they're going to be in a wheelchair. So, yeah. I think, you know, to me, this is a critique about racism as much as it is about another, another field, and that we need to just yeah. decenter or recenter on those questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in public health, since these are the crucial questions that they're really important for the whole society. I mean, yeah. it's not just about black people or disabled people, it's about America. Yeah. Yeah. One of the reasons I moved, you know, I moved um, in, out of queer studies into disability studies was because of the ability to talk about the body in, in productive ways. I think, you know, and this is maybe my unfair reading of both queer and feminist thought, but we, we really haven't thought about the body too much. Now there is, Sarah Ahmed's going to talk today about queer phenomenology, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're starting to get, but when I was starting my graduate career, that move was how can we talk about the body in ways that we can think about productively. Part of it was thinking about epidemiology um, and thinking, for example, with the deaf community, there is both a sort of um, physicality. Um, my first book was on the deaf community and, and identity. And there's a physicality to deafness, but there's also this identity aspect. And the two are really tied together. And you need to think about institutions. You need to think about um, rubella epidemics, you need to think about um, structures of power, all of those complexities go in in a way that makes the body both something that acts in the world in a particular way, but it's also acted upon in particular ways. And that's what I like about disability is that we can't ever sort of let go of that tension and that there's a tension between <coughs> our politics which are arguing for our civil rights and our need to be treated equal equally, at the same time acknowledging that for many of us our bi body minds are not functioning at the level that we want them to, let alone what society expects of us or are functioning in different ways and how do we take apart those contradictions, but at ma in many ways recognizing that this notion of function is embedded in all these complex systems of power and what it means to function and when it means to function in particular ways are uh, all highly, highly problematic. And so, but that's what I like about disability because it, it, I, I, I feel like, and we have an activist community that's always on our butts um, in, in particularly productive ways that I, I think is useful. At least, you know, um, I think we're still in, in, engage in good discussion and we get our, our, our butts kicked in productive ways by, by the activists who are arguing and, and responding to us and in many ways, for example, um, not in, uh, allowing us to drift too much into high theory, discon utterly disconnected, pulling us back down. 
So, but that, but yeah, again, I'm trying to sell the Kool-Aid here to, to y'all. <laughs> so, um, I think that is what? Can I, oh, can yeah. I may, uh, Marcia Saxon. Hello. Um, <laughs> oh, your opening line was so interesting to me. And um, if you don't mind my being provocative, uh -huh. what do you anticipate a white privileged audience like this to not be able to tolerate of what you raised? Mm -hmm. Um, oh, um, I, I think that um, my concern is that, oh no, we've always been thinking about race, but we coordinate off in a nice, easy way that doesn't help. You know, yes, we, th we'll th we think about race in these texts, and as long as we contain them within these texts or within these populations, it never has to engage in our other sort of sorts of discussions. And so, it would be a, a, a bifold. Uh, yes, we've, we've, we're talking about it, but, but underneath that would be, we're talking about it in safe ways. And so sort of my provoca provocation was this twofold one, which is no, we're not talking about it enough, as well as if we really want to deal with it um, fully, it's, we have to do it in a way that sort of complicates everything, that it's not something that you can just take out and cordon off. So that was um, perhaps some of the, um, things that I was perhaps anticipating was someone would say, well, we, deal, we do deal with it. We have these texts, da, 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 da. And so, um. Yeah, take it. pick up on that and um, respond to your very fair and um, nuanced sharing of insights with a very unfair and offensively banal question, yeah. <laughs> um, which is um, kind of the research to impact uh, question. Um, Picking up on, you know, one of the insights uh, I, I take from your presentation uh, is, you know, what we see and read and know inscribed in these disciplinary field uh, texts depends a lot on, you know, who's doing the production. And um, so suppose in some fantasy land, you know, our, our chancellor has stumbled onto the website and, and, and uh, encounters your presentation and is completely convinced by it, and then um, this is where the fantasy part comes in. Comes up to you and says, okay, resources are no uh, problem here. I want you to <laughs> design something so that Berkeley can be a flagship institution that really addresses you know, uh, this, this big uh, void that you have identified. So what would that look like? Yeah. Um, so if, if campus gave Typhus, one tenth of what it's spending on intercollegiate athletics, or maybe even one one hundredth of what it's spending on intercollegiate athletics. I think the main thing I would want is, you know, more of these conversations. I feel like when I had first seen Hyphus, um, when the job ad came, um, when um, Catherine actually sent me it, and I thought, wow, there's an organization at UC Berkeley called the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, and this is its mandate. I was just blown away. Um, but to be honest, I was expecting more conversations across the clusters and, um, and more of a central space in which those conversations could, could happen. And I think our lack of space of sort of communi uh, community, uh, communal sharing has allowed us to eat, each think, oh, I'm doing diversity, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and not have to cross over. I think, you know, this is what I'm going to, um, in Japan we say, grind the sesame seeds. Um, American has a, a much more vulgar term. But I'm going to grind sesame seeds by saying, at least under your stewardship, I think we've had more of these conversations. Um, but I think when we get that budget, one one hundredth of the intercollegiate budget, it would be to have a place um, structured maybe similar to Townsend and how they are trying to foster those, those conversations, um, both amongst the faculty, but the grad students as well. It, it almost feels like you and I rehearsed that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Can I say something about that? There are a couple of things that don't cost anything, I think, that I would just salt in terms of the kind of conversation that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. One is that the consideration in every one of those projects? Mm -hmm. People actually made sure 
to conceptualize disability as a problem within them, to include disabled scholars um, off campus and on. Or to take another example, I put out, um, talk about virtue signaling, and, and not, not just virtue. I put out ads about this talk by Karen, and I added in language about it's wheelchair accessible, century, et cetera, because the generic cost publicity for every event that happens doesn't say it's wheelchair accessible. Please don't wear a sense. Um, here's the person you contact for ASL. This should not be something that is ever only in an event that has to do with the disability studies program or a disability mm -hmm. research cluster on this campus, and mm -hmm. yet it, it is, and it doesn't cost a penny. Mm -hmm. But uh, do, along with well, disability <laughs> being this mechanism for thinking of um, through various categories, I would include, I mean, same thing, let's think about race through all the categories, let's think about poverty through all the educa uh, educational barriers, health care, um, and so forth, through all of them. And, uh, and those are, I think, hopefully those are sorts of conversations we can have at, at IFAS as we sort of roll into the new future. Great. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>